talking about Empedocles. But before we move on to Empedocles, it would probably be helpful to look at a timeline showing the philosophers we've talked about so far in their historical context. On the top, you can see the Ionians, um, including the first big three, Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes, um, and Xenophanes, uh, who sort of stands alone, uh, not very related in his works to any of the other philosophers that we've talked about, uh, and Heraclitus. Uh, toward the bottom, you can see in Italy and Sicily, uh, Pythagoras, um, Parmenides, uh, and then our current philosopher Empedocles. Um, there's a connection in the thought of those philosophers um, from Italy with the thought of those from Sicily, and it's a little bit of a different feel in general from the Ionians. So I hope that helps you situate things in their context. It is hard to imagine a more dramatic and sensational philosopher than Empedocles, the charismatic and unconventional philosopher from Acragas on the coast of Sicily. So if you look at this map, you can see Agricas on the western portion of the island of Sicily. And Italy is right up above it. You can see the tip of the boot of Italy, though it's obscured partially by that picture there. Empedocles saw himself as a mystical, prophetic figure, and all of his works are pervaded by a religious tone that is much more pronounced than any pre-Socratic philosopher. In talking of his origin and his identity, Empedocles says, there is an oracle of necessity, an ancient decree of the gods, eternal and sealed with broad oaths, that whenever one of the gods pollutes his own dear limbs with the sin of bloodshed, commits an offense and swears a false oath, he wanders away from the Blessed Ones for thrice 10,000 seasons, through time growing to be all sorts of different animals, taking the difficult paths of lives one after another, for the force of Ither pursues them to the sea, and the sea spits them out onto the surface of the earth, and the earth into the rays of the shining sun, and he casts them all into the vortices of Ither. One receives them one after another, but all hate them. Of these, I am now one, a fugitive from the gods and a wanderer, putting my reliance on raving strife. This is not exactly an ordinary introduction of the type that we might imagine. Well, I grew up in Agricas, I went to school with the Pythagoreans, and I've got a really good talent for basket weaving. No, Empedocles claims to be a renegade deity, a god who committed some grave crime and for that was banished for tens of thousands of years. The whole saga looks like some bizarre pre-Socratic soap opera, but it is not without precedent. Thor, Odin's son, you have betrayed the express command of your king. Through your arrogance and stupidity, you have opened these peaceful realms and innocent lives to the horror and desolation of war. You are Unworthy of these realms, you're unworthy of your title! You're unworthy! I now take from you your power in the name of my father and his father before. I own it, all, Father! Cast you out! We have evidence that Empedocles was heavily influenced by the followers of Pythagoras a famous pre-Socratic philosopher whose works and teachings are mired in obscurity. The Pythagorean theorem, by the way, does take its name from Pythagoras, but it is hard to know whether he actually invented it. There seem to have been two strains of Pythagoreanism. The one strain focused on proto-scientific attempts to reduce the world to numerical analyses. For instance, to explain how mathematical progressions could be seen in great works of music. The other strain of Pythagoreanism involved a much more mystical approach, emphasizing ethical precepts and the necessity of purifying oneself from the evils all around. According to this approach, each soul undergoes an almost endless series of lives and deaths. In one life you could be a human, in another a bird, in another a dog, in another an insect, and so on. 
It is this second strain of Pythagoreanism that we see in Empedocles, with a strong emphasis on the power of mystical revelation and the importance of reincarnation. As Empedocles elsewhere says about himself, I have already been born as a boy and a girl and a bush and a bird and a mute fish in the sea. And in order to stake his claim to authority on the nature of the universe, he says to his countrymen, Friends who dwell in the great city on the yellow Akragas, on the heights of the citadel, you whose care is good deeds, respectful haven for strangers, untouched by evil, hail. I go among you, an immortal god, no longer mortal, honored among all as it seems, wreathed with headbands and blooming garlands. Wherever I go to their flourishing cities, I am revered by all, men and women. And they follow together in tens of thousands, inquiring where lies the path to profit, some in need of prophecy, while others, pierced for a long time with harsh pains, ask to hear the voice of healing for all diseases. As you can see from the passage, we are no longer talking about a traditional philosopher. Empedocles claimed to be a miracle worker, a prophet, a god. Unlike Parmenides, Empedocles did not feel any necessity of defending his first principles with extensive argumentation. Since he was a god, he obviously knew all about the world, and he couldn't be bothered with defending every piece of his reasoning. There's an interesting contrast here between Parmenides and Empedocles. Both of them talk about a journey into the realm of the gods, but Parmenides uses the insight of this journey to defend an argument fully accessible to the ordinary man. Empedocles, in contrast, proceeds in a way that seems unphilosophical. He cites his identity as a god as evidence for the truth of his claim. But that does not mean that his investigations were entirely lacking in merit. Empedocles may very well have advanced our scientific understanding more than any other pre-Socratic philosopher, especially when it came to his work on the elements. He proposed that there were exactly four elements that composed all material reality, earth, air, fire, and water. Further, he proposed that these elements corresponded to four central properties of matter, the hot, the cold, the wet, and the dry. This elemental system was adopted by Aristotle and came to be the predominant way of explaining the world for over a thousand years. Empedocles followed Parmenides in claiming that the things that exist cannot alter in any fundamental sense. He parted from Parmenides, however, in claiming that there are many things this is pluralism, and in saying that these things can move without changing in themselves. When the elements blend together or fall apart, the sorts of apparent changes that we observe occur. No thing is changing, however, despite the fact that things appear to change. Quotation, there is coming to be of not a single one of all mortal things, nor is there any end in destructive death, but only mixture and separation of what is mixed. It is instructive to compare this with Heraclitus and Parmenides. For Heraclitus, the world is constantly moving and changing at every level, and stability arises from the tensions associated with the change. For Parmenides, nothing moves nor changes, and stability exists in stasis. Empedocles sets the tone for the future of metaphysics and science when he departs from his forebears and says that things change in one sense, but not in another. Things move and mix, but they do not change their nature. Indeed, they cannot. But what explains the movement of the elements, their admixtures and separations? The answer is that there are two forces, forces he calls love and strife. If you're keeping score, we have four elements, four properties, and two forces. Parmenides kept things a lot more simple and tidy, didn't he? Love is a principle of unity among the elements, by which they come together despite their diversity. We might imagine love as a sort of cosmic dating app between the elements, causing them to unite. When love runs free and it comes to completely dominate the cosmos, everything becomes fully mixed with everything else. And something Empedocles calls harmonia arises. Harmonia is equal to itself on all sides, and wholly without limit, a rounded sphere exulting in its joyous solitude. He has no feet, no swift knees, no hairy genitals, but is only mind, holy and indescribable. 
darting through the entire cosmos with his swift thoughts. We can see here that the world is intelligent, and it is maximally intelligent when it is all gathered in one place, the ultimate meeting of minds, I suppose. Also notice how similar this dominance of love is to Parmenides' one, the perfect sphere. The big difference, of course, is that this sphere is not changeless. It does, in fact, change. Even at the zenith of love in the cosmos, something dark and divisive is afoot. Strife is being nourished in its limbs, and it leaps up and begins to gain power, causing the elements to gradually separate into their own categories. Air clings to air, fire to fire, and so on. This process takes a long time, but in its, comple in its completion, we find that the world is entirely segregated. When it finally reaches that point, the era of love begins anew, however, and things begin coming together again. Somewhere in the course of this mixing and mingling, animal and human life occurs. The details about how this relates to love and strife are somewhat lacking. We might expect sexual activity to be a form of mixture and violence to be a form of separation, but if so, we should be puzzled as to why both violence and sex can occur during the same period, if not in the same place. Details aside, Empedocles gives an account of animal origins that is as fascinating as it is innovative. He literally envisions different parts of the body scattered about on the ground, scattered because of the domination of strife. As love predominates, however, these limbs and heads and bodies mix, a bit haphazardly. By love, many neckless faces sprouted, and arms were wandering naked, bereft of shoulders, and eyes were roaming alone, in need of foreheads. Talk about bizarre. More bizarre still is the notion that some of these attempted unions failed. Many grew with faces and chests on both sides, man-faced ox progeny, and some, to the contrary, rose up as ox-headed things with the form of men, partly compounded from men and partly from women, fitted with shadowy parts. But when divinity was mixed to a greater extent with divinity, these things began to fall together, however they chanced to meet, and many others, in addition, arose continually. What on earth is Empedocles talking about? On a close inspection of the text, it should become quite clear. At some point in the cosmic cycle, Things have unified enough to become body parts, but not formed any cohesive body. So they experiment. A head tries fitting with another head. An ankle sees how good it looks on top of a nose, and so on. Most of these combinations fail miserably, but sometimes they actually work out. And this is how animals and humans come to be properly formed. Notice how remarkable this story is as a creation story for the human race. Although Empedocles certainly was not making any claim to some sort of evolution from one species to another, he anticipated the mechanism that later evolutionary theories would hinge upon, natural selection. There is no designer for the human race and no premeditated plan for the formation of humans on Empedocles' view. Instead, we have conscious body parts. This is an important and downright goofy point. The body parts would appear to be conscious. In fact, every aspect of the world would appear to be conscious on Empedocles' view. We have conscious body parts making decisions that may, if they're lucky, result in survival and fitness. There are lots of conversations we might have about whether Empedocles' theory was plausible, given his observations, but it certainly was clever. In the end, Empedocles was scarcely as important as he made himself out to be, but he was hardly unimportant. His physical theories have had an enduring influence, and his ingenuity as an observer of natural phenomenon made an impression on the likes of Aristotle. Still, his religious approach to the acquisition of knowledge rubbed some people the wrong way. He was undoubtedly a great man, an appreciant scholar, and he may even have been a philosopher. There's no sense in telling me the wisdom of the fool.